JP Sears, Market Disruptors on the Mark Moss Show. I appreciate you taking the time. Yeah, brother, pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, we've uh, we've had the pleasure of getting to do some spaces together. We're on a text thread. We you know do that back and forth quite a bit, but uh, finally get to sit down and talk. So that's cool. Um, I've been watching your videos for quite a while. I think my wife was probably a bigger fan and uh, she loves the stuff and I love the stuff and everybody does. You've got millions of followers now at this point. Trillions, potentially. <laughs> millions, trillions, what's the difference, right? <laughs> um, we lose sight of those numbers after some point, but uh, with millions of followers, literally on YouTube, um, so we probably don't need a big introduction, but I would like to know a little bit more of the backstory. I just know of you from YouTube. I know you're doing some stand-up comedy now. Mm -hmm. But how did you get to be JP Sears doing comedy on uh, political issues? Will we call it that? Yeah, you know, I'll, the, the high level view from above, it's an equation that has two parts. Part number one of the equation is happy accident. Okay. Part number two is me doing my best to follow my heart. Okay. But expanding that, before I was doing anything in comedy, I was in the, the health and fitness world. No wonder you're so buff. Yeah, just, thank you. It took you long enough for, for you to notice, Mark. Well, I just didn't comment yet. But. <laughs> so I was in the health and fitness world, health coach, and that developed into uh, stress reduction coaching, emotional healing coaching over my 13-year career in that field. And it was very satisfying helping people help themselves get out of their own way, heal emotional issues that they've got going on and basically facilitate them connecting to their hearts. And it, it was great. But along the way, I was telling myself like, you know, I'm, I'm a life coach kind of guy. It would right. be bad to let my sense of humor out in a right. public professional setting. So quite honestly, I intentionally was constipating my sense of humor and my professional life right you know i was doing a little bit of youtube like here's a life coaching video uh but how, how long ago was this this was so i put out my first like sincere youtube video in 2013 okay but i started life coaching like in 2004 okay. or so and so basically it was i was young and insecure to the point where it's like i can't be myself but along the way, I started getting these ideas to let my sense of humor out to express my opinions and perspectives about things through the language of humor. So I yeah. had these ideas, like I could do this video to portray a certain idea. And eventually it became an itch I had to scratch. Like, yeah. this is a dumb idea. It'll discredit me as a life coach, but I gotta do it. Right. So I did it, but it woke something up inside of me where it was a level of creative satisfaction I had never known before. So I decided like, I, I like this. Let me, let me make more comedy videos. Yeah. Never thinking it'd be a thing, just thinking like I'll do one or two or three and yeah. then that will will be dry. But along the way, I, I, you know, nine, 12 months into it, I realized like, oh, this is a well that doesn't run dry. Like wherever creativity yeah. comes from, yeah. It's kind of an infinite source is how I look at it. Yet the comedy I was doing was principally like kind of like borrowing concepts from the life coaching world, nutritional world, spiritual making, making world. Making fun of that stuff? Making fun of that stuff, stuff that was very important to me, but right. also calling out our egotistical nature that shows up in the spiritual realm or where, you know, I'm gluten intolerant, right. so I want you to know I'm, I'm a little better than you. <laughs> so that kind yeah. of thing, it all, stuff that mattered to me but nothing political that all changed about two years ago when our freedom started getting taken is that away. that you, is that that you didn't talk about that or that you weren't really paying attention to i it? was not paying attention okay. to it at all two years ago if you said jp give me the difference between a democrat and a re republican i honestly would have no idea how do i still have no idea but <laughs> <laughs> does anybody we have opinions but yeah so it, it was that realm just didn't matter to me. And yeah. part of that was ignorance. And another part was we had it easy. Mm -hmm. we, we, and I'll speak for myself, I was living in a world where we could take our freedoms for granted. Yeah. Not saying that was a good idea, but I was taking them for granted. But then two years ago when our freedoms start getting taken away, I realized, oh, well, a fish doesn't know it's swimming in water. Yeah until you start to take the freedom water away. And that yeah. helped me realize pretty darn quick, 
freedom is my number one value. Right. It's the very thing that makes life worth living. Yeah. It's the one thing that all people will eventually becoming, become willing to die in the name of if they're deprived of freedom that long. It's yeah. human nature. Yeah. So then freedom became a political topic for some reason. The world that I used to remember, it was both sides were for freedom. Maybe they had different like it. different ideas on how to uphold it or strive for greater freedom. But you know, we wake up in this world two years ago where the left is anti-freedom and the right is pro-freedom. Right. So that was me getting into the political world simply because I have to stand for freedom. I see freedoms being taken away. And I don't envision a world where I have to explain to my son what freedom was. How old is your son? He just turned one. For everybody watching this interview, I take notes of things I want to come back to. I got some grief on another podcast. Like, why do you keep checking your phone? That's so rude. It's like, I'm not checking my phone. I'm making notes. So I don't. Now you're on you. TikTok. Okay. <laughs> I'm watching your videos. So I know how to talk to you. I make notes. so I know what to come back to. Now, how old is your son? He just turned one in yeah. December. So I think that has a lot to do with it, I would imagine. I know uh, for me, I have two kids and um, going through the pandemic and seeing the world shift on them has really just brought this sense of urgency to me. Right? I, 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 I would imagine so. And for me, it was a perfect storm of passion because my wife and I found out she was pregnant, uh, I think it was April 7th, mm. 2020. Right. right around the time we start to figure out this two weeks to slow the spread. Yeah. Doesn't seem like it's really about a virus. Right. So you being a father, you have that million year old thing inside of you that was waking up in me at the time yeah. where you realize like I, I will do anything to protect my children. And part of that means protecting their future. So I realized like, okay, you know, getting into the political arena, it can you, you can lose audience, you can piss people off, it, you can get deplatformed. However, none of that mattered because my son's coming into the world yeah. and I need to do just little old me, but I have to do everything in my power to strengthen the vibration of freedom and uh, not succumb to the, the uh, obedience to give away yeah. freedoms. Well, like you said, it's the one thing most people are willing to die for. And so I think it brings that, that seriousness. Now, um, I know this is typically a finance channel. We talk about money. Um, obviously, we're diving a little bit off of that path, but stick with me because uh, I want to talk to you. We're going to continue to talk about, I like to talk about financial sovereignty. So it's really about mm -hmm. sovereignty. Money is a piece of that. Um, obviously, that's under attack, which we're talking about our freedoms under attack. I know you and I have been doing a little bit of work on some ways to help beat some of the censorship to maybe kind of push back on that war on freedom. And there's some economic incentives tied into that. We're not going to spoil it. So we're going to bring it all the way back to uh, freedom, sovereignty, the new stuff that you and I have been working on, the technology and the money side of that. Um, so a lot to get into. Um, but before we dive down that, I'm just curious. Um, so maybe just for my own curiosity, because I'm a YouTube guy as well. Um, how long did it take you to start gaining some traction when you first started making these videos before? Um, well, sometimes it can be a very slow start and you don't know why you're doing them. Did you get traction right away with your videos? Well, well I'll give you a two part answer. So given that I was doing kind of just straight up sincere, quite frankly, boring life coaching videos, uh -huh. hopefully informative, okay. but I was doing those for a year and a half before I put out my first comedy video. Oh, so you used the same audience, same channel. I did, okay. you know, okay. ignorance. I know if I was like doing it again, I'd, oh, I should start a different channel, but yeah. it was like, I don't really know what I'm doing. So yeah. off I go. But in the, the year and a half of just doing the sincere videos, I had amassed a YouTube following of about 2,000 subscribers. Mm, wow. And I was proud of that. Yeah. And, and that was at the level where it's like if a video gets 100 views within a week or two, yeah. it's pretty good. Yeah. But then when I, when I put my first comedy video out, that gained a lot of traction right away unintentionally. So what had happened, I published it just on YouTube and it got maybe a, a few hundred views within mm -hmm. 
uh, the first week, which is big. Well, that's viral. That's yeah, triple that's viral. Yeah. But what happened, uh, someone had just ripped it off my YouTube channel and published it to Facebook. And back at the time, uploading video natively on Facebook, it wasn't common practice. It was super new, so I didn't do that. But some, uh, uh, actually a few pages did, and it went pretty viral on Facebook, got a, a few million views on their channels. Yeah. But they, they at least like gave my name in the video. So that had people like tracking me down on YouTube. So, uh, you know, I start to get a few thousand more uh, subscribers. So the, once I started doing comedy videos, the traction, it, it started coming right away mm. small doses yeah. medium doses but there was traction yeah that's good yeah sometimes it's a slow road but if you're following your passion you can stick with it but uh nice to see that the audience responded to that yeah it, and i and i always told myself and i say this to anybody it, if you do videos in a way where it's worth you doing them even if no one watches them because it gives you that much joy creative satisfaction self-expression yeah that's a win and i think it's part of the recipe for being in it for the long haul because yeah. growth usually doesn't happen overnight. Uh, so yeah, I mean, uh, being a personal trainer or a personal development coach, right? It doesn't come overnight. And so you, you don't just go to the gym one time and go, ah, I didn't get any results, right? It's like, a, and, and if you stop going even after years, then you lose those results. So it's like that same thing. Yeah. Um, jumping back into the kind of freedom piece, something you said was that, um, and this is something I've said, but you said that you think that there's this like human drive the human nature wants freedom. And I say that too. I believe humans have this innate drive for freedom. A lot of people don't agree with that. A lot of people go, no, no, most people just want to be told what to do. Yeah. Most people just want to be led. Um, how do you push back on that? Or how do you reconcile yeah. those two? Yeah, I, I think fear wants to be validated with fear. And, and what I mean by that is a, a lot of people navigate their life with a North Star of not their heart, not their soul, not even their critical thinking mind, but they navigate life through fear. And that could be like, hey, there's limiting beliefs from childhood, maybe mm -hmm. pain and traumas from childhood right. that aren't resolved. And so when you've got psychological scar tissue, you know, it's just like physical scar tissue. Mm -hmm. It constricts, right. it contracts when it's not healed appropriately. And fear is that constricting consciousness so when we're living in fear, we, we want to validate the, in, in my opinion, we want to validate the limitations we put on ourselves that make us feel protected relative to the fears that we still carry. Yeah. So freedom is the scariest thing to fear. So it, show me someone who says, hey, freedom's dangerous, we're better off without it. I'll show you someone who's carrying a lot of fear and they mm -hmm. see life through the lens of fear. But when we're more of a warrior in life, it doesn't mean we're free from fear, but it means we're not limited by our fear. Yeah. We have fears, we're afraid of things, but we tend to be the type of person that does those things anyway. Yeah. And a friend of mine named Tim Kennedy, he's just, mm -hmm. Amazing human, yep. former UFC fighter, um, uh, Green Beret. Another ranch owner out here in the Austin area. Indeed. Yep. And he says, you've got two choices in the world we live in. You can choose peaceful slavery or dangerous freedom. Mm -hmm. I think to the, the human ego, freedom seems dangerous mm -hmm. because it's not controlled. And we tend to fear anything that we isn't within the confines yeah. of our control. Or you can choose peaceful slavery. Live inside the coffin of your comfort zone. It'll be very comfortable, very constricting, uh, very controlled, but it won't be a meaningful life. Yeah. I think of it, uh, the perfect example, which we've all heard, is the lion. And the lion's the king of the jungle, top of the food chain, can kill anything. It lives in the wild, it's free, but it's not a safe, easy life. It has to fight other lions. It may or may not get food, it may go time without food could be hunted and killed, um, but it's free. Yeah. Or it could live in a cage and gets antibiotics and one meal a day. And it's safe, but it's not free. Um, the one thing though, is that I think there's this misconception about safety because um, while that person that seeks that safety, um, it's not free, but it's safe, isn't really 
because his entire life is held in somebody else's hands that could any time change their mind versus over here, the freedom, which is dangerous freedom to your point, at least they don't have one person that could just like flip a switch on them at any time, yeah. you know? Uh, I agree with what you're alluding to, brother. Yeah. So I it's like this illusion that isn't there. The, yeah, the illusion of it and the sensation of safety. So if you look at people right now who are giving their freedoms away very obediently under the belief of this is for my safety, you and I could look at that and say, well, that's probably the most dangerous thing they mm -hmm. could do. But it provides the sensation of safety. Yeah. And then I, I would dare say the other side of that paradox when we look at freedom, I think f being free is the safest thing right. we can ever do. But the paradox is, it feels dangerous. Thus, the Tim Qu Kennedy quote, dangerous freedom, that's actually safe, but it feels dangerous. Right. Um, yeah. You know, you being as an entrepreneur, you're in control of your destiny. Yeah. Your risk of failure is it's way high. higher than yeah. someone in a corporate job. So your risk of failure is way higher. So sometimes it has a sensation of this isn't as safe. It's a good example, and I've actually thought about this a lot because I've never really had a job. I tell my wife, I'm, well, I've been professionally unemployed. Uh, she's like, come on, you always have a job, but I've never been employed. I've just kind of figured out how to make money. And I've looked at people who crave that, that um, safety of a job, and they have the 10-year, 20-year, whatever job. But I look at that as unsafe because now they're so trained in that one job. If they get fired, which people lose their jobs all the time, they don't know what else to do. And I just always looked at it as going to make money. And sure, it hasn't been a smooth road, it's been up and down, but like my safety is I know how to go make money. Like I know how to go hunt. If you've only lived in a cage being fed a meal and you don't have that meal anymore, you don't know how to go hunt anymore. Exactly, and hasn't the whole pandemic shattered the illusion of what's safe? Where yeah. you, you, you find people who have dedicated their lives to taking the safe route, safety, security, you know, do the responsible yeah. thing, work for the corporation or whatever it is. And maybe they haven't like really followed their heart, but they've done so out of safety. And then we have all the lockdowns, so many businesses going out of business, they can't operate, yep. uh, people getting let go. And we realize like, oh, that was actually really dangerous. Yeah. You, you put your livelihood in the hands of someone else, I think, you know, God gives us hands for a reason and that's to hold our own livelihood amongst yeah, other things. I like that. Now you, you're you talking about freedom, we're talking about freedom, um, freedom versus safety. What is freedom to you? Yeah, man, that's a... Freedom, freedom and freedom of what or from what or what's freedom? Man, great question. I'd love to hear your answer too. But uh, <laughs> well, I'm asking you, but I'm happy yeah. to tell you. <laughs> but you know, a, a couple of things that come to my mind is freedom is a commitment to following one's heart and uh, guidance from above, your higher self, your w whatever you think you're connected to. I, I think freedom is being in service to that. Uh, freedom, in my opinion, is also a state of surrender, contrary to control, would be uh, uh, anti-freedom. And then the, the third word I'll throw at this fragmented definition is freedom is expansion. You, you look at the universe, it's always expanding, and that's the macro. And I do believe the microcosm is a mirror of the macrocosm. I think our innate nature in every aspect of our being mentally emotionally physically spiritually our innate nature is expansion and expansion being synonymous with freedom if you don't have freedom you can't have expansion and that might be self-imposed limits on our freedom like we our minds always wanting to expand but we put these limiting beliefs on well we got to play it safe or right. i got to meet expectations so we limit our own freedom ourselves indeed it, it, i do believe the world most people live in if you're in a first world country nobody takes your freedom more than you do yeah um so i love that question i haven't thought about that in yeah. a while but i'd love to hear what do sure. you think freedom is? Sure, something I have thought a lot about. I think uh, obviously to your point, I agree. The, there's Humans have this drive for freedom. It's something that people are willing to die for. 
My grandfather was a decorated World War II vet. My father flew jets in Vietnam. I mean, we fight for freedom, right? Um, for me, I think freedom is very simple. Um, freedom from what? Uh, the freedom of what? And I would say it's the freedom to choose. Yeah. The freedom Beautiful. to choose. Um, I'd like to swap out the word freedom for liberty. Yeah. And uh, one of my favorite economists, uh, Hayek, F.A. Hayek, he, uh, he wrote a book. I think it was a seminal work. His last book was The Constitution of Liberty. Mm-hmm. And uh, one of the smartest guys ever. And in his book, it's a master class. It's uh, 1,900 citations in nine different languages. People will never be that smart again. <laughs> anyway, he defines liberty as freedom from coercion. Yeah. So coercion being, uh, being uh, explained as um, a choice, either choice leads to my ends. Mm. You either take the jab or quit your job. Either choice, you have a choice, but either choice leads to my ends. So liberty is freedom of coercion. So I have the right to choose um, the decision that leads me to my ends. Yeah. Right. Um, so that's right. Freedom of choice. Right. And that's, that's kind of the way I look at it. And so, um, even if somebody, um, wants to be told what to do, um, that's their freedom to choose that. Right. I don't want, and, and actually making no decision is a decision. For sure. So, uh, but they're still free to choose as opposed to, unfortunately, we're having our choices taken away from us, you know, or, uh, Choose A or B, freedom of choice, right? Yeah. So I would say that's pretty simple, just a freedom to choose. Uh, I, I love that. And I think our, we have, as, as humans in general, I think we have, we're so clueless about how powerful we are. Mm-hmm. You know, somebody can be sitting there and then my life sucks. I have no choice, but they don't realize they're exercising, what you just said, they're exercising their power of choice mm-hmm. by choosing to not choose. Yeah. They're choosing to not change. So we're, we can be so blind to our power, but when we notice how are we expressing our power and, and we tend to need to get the lens of self-responsibility out yeah. to realize how we're exercising our power. But when we notice how we're doing it, then we have, I, I would dare say, conscious choice yeah. where we can be much more alert of what we're choosing and more deliberate and hopefully choose in a way that's in the best interest of ourself. Yeah. And I think when we're coming from that place, it tends to be beneficial for the world and community around us. Yeah. All right. So now let's take it a next step further than that. So um, freedom to choose. Um, if our freedoms are being taken away, our choices are being taken away, maybe ch- maybe choices and freedom is almost like this interchangeable word. If my freedoms are taken away, my choices are yeah. being taken away. Um, at least the choices that I want to make. And so then we have tyranny, right? So tyranny is the government kind of imposing their will on us. Um, at the talk I just gave this last week with Ron Paul, I was explaining and I was showing how um, the Federal Register, the amount of uh, regulations we have, has shot up like a skyrocket since 1971. Um, and basically, um, the government's, um, government and individualism are on opposite ends of a teeter-totter. So the more that government grows, the less liberty we have, and the more liberty we have, the government, right? And it kind of goes like that. Um, so we have this like tyranny, this growing sense of gov- government. Um, I don't know if you've seen or, or learned much, but um, there's another channel on YouTube. I've referenced it before. Um, it's called the Academy of Ideas. I'm maybe I, maybe I talked to you about that before. And they talk a lot about the, the fall of uh, the USSR and kind of how that, that happened. And they talk about how um, humor and comedy is one of the best ways to beat that. I don't know if you've picked up on that. And I think they talk about because, um, one, you kind of have this uh, tongue-in-cheek kind of catty way to uh, say it, which you kind of do. You kind of get around it because it's comedy. But at the same time, it draws attention and kind of makes fun. Yeah of it at the same time. So they talk about how, um, yeah, comedy is a really good way to attack that that system, that status quo. Have you thought about using comedy that way or did it just kind of come natural? Well, it it, it came natural and I've also gotten now very, you've seen it. very intentional and deliberate. Okay. It's like, oh, I noticed this, the, the sword, uh, it's, it's a very effective weapon. So I've noticed it mm-hmm. and then worked on deliberately harnessing the, skills and the application of it. 
And, and I, being a comedian, of course, I'm biased. I agree. Like, oh, comedian's the most important job in the world. I mean, it's uh, powerful. But when, when it comes in the face of tyranny, specifically, specifically, as you mentioned, one of the reasons I believe it's so effective is we first have to understand tyranny is based on lies. It, it only infiltrates to the degree that they can get people to accept their lies. And that's what propaganda is. But what comedy is, the first, in my opinion, the most important principle of comedy is the truth principle. For something to be funny, there has to be a foundation right. of truth from which you're launching off of yeah. in order to generate authentic laughter in a, a person. They have to be connected to a reality Usually you show them a reality they weren't aware of and the recognition of that reality that is true, right. their instant recognition of it comes out in the form of laughter. That's right. a sensation of, I saw something that I didn't know before. Right. Um, they just connected to a mystery. But if you don't have the truth principle in comedy, you can be goofy, you can be saying things, you can have the infrastructure of a joke, but not truth, and it won't strike the human heart, soul, and psyche as funny. Yeah, People can fake laughter, but it won't be genuine laughter. Now, when we combine that with tyranny, when you have someone making jokes about tyranny, if you get people laughing, they're laughing because you are exposing truth that they try to hide mm. under the blanket of propaganda. Yeah. So I think the Academy of Ideas, their their piece, which I, is excellent piece, I think that was on mass formation psychosis. Maybe. Um, the video you're referencing, it. I do believe comedians right now have a very important job because there's a lot of truth that needs to be pointed out. And if you get someone laughing, it means they can, they just saw the truth yeah. about something, yeah. even if it's just for a millisecond. Yeah. I think there's something like, and you may maybe know from your kind of coaching days, but it's like um, you can't really have uh, like, you can't really be fearful and have like joy at your heart at the same time. Yeah. And so like if, if, if people are controlled by fear, then you can bring them joy and they can laugh. It almost like pushes the other one out maybe almost as well. Maybe maybe pushes that fear out enough for them to actually think a little bit more clearly about that. Hell yeah. And, and you know, we think about like how do, how can the many, or I'm sorry, how can the few control the many? Right. And we know well, fear is the only way. But like you just said, if you get someone out of fear into a different state of mind, whether yeah. it's a thoughtful state of mind, a happy place, for for that moment, those moments, they're not coming from a place of fear, so they are not controllable in that moment because they haven't, you know, held out their 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 plug of fear for the socket of tyranny to go yeah. into. Yeah, I never thought about that before, Mark, but I think you raise a very enlightened point. Yeah, well, I think maybe that's one reason why why comedy is so successful. Yeah. Um, because someone can shift that thinking. Now, um, the next part about comedy, which has seemed to come under attack, comedy just overall, I hear Joe Rogan talking about this all the time, is that uh, we live in this politically correct world today, and so you can't really poke fun at these things because it's not politically correct to. Um, because to your point, there has to be a little bit of truth, so you're kind of really calling something out. And of course, through the political correct world, whether that be you know, gender things or race or sex things or whatever. Today, obviously, it's political things. So I guess the next part is uh, is censorship, yeah. right? So in order to keep the tyranny, um, they don't have good ideas. Good ideas would win in an open market. They would compete for ideas. But because their ideas can't win, then they have no choice. Instead of to debate or compete, they can only censor. Right. So um, how is it being a comedian and trying to deal with censorship? Yeah. And what do you think about that issue overall? Well, you know, the, the the first piece of that that maybe even before we get to censorship is the the social censorship where we look at there's backlash, there's cancel culture if you say something politically incorrect. So, in my opinion, to be a good comedian, I'm not just talking about myself, but whoever it is. Dave Chappelle. Dave Chappelle, for sure. <laughs> a good comedian is going to be true to themselves. Yeah. They're going to have a perspective. They're going to be true to the, their perspective. And there's going to be a level of 
actual truth in their perspective as well. Not complete truth. We're not in the mind of God, but right. there's going to be that. So you have to have courage to be true to yourself. Now, if you have cowardice instead of courage and you're a comedian, you'd say, well, I have a joke about this. It exposes an uncomfortable truth, but I'm politically incorrect. Like people, some people might get mad because they're insecure about a given topic, I'm like cancel culture. So I'm going to censor myself because I don't have the courage to be true to myself. So that's internal censorship. And yeah. I, I think courage over cowardice wins any day. Yeah. It's one of those things where as a comedian, you can say, well, short term, it's going to be uncomfortable to speak the uncomfortable truth through yeah. the joke. It'll be uncomfortable in the short term, but long term, it's, it's got to be very uncomfortable. Yeah. Right. But long term, it's way more comfortable to let yourself be yourself. And that's part of what freedom is. You give yourself permission to be yourself. But then a comedian who says, no, 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 like I'm, I'm not going to say the joke because it's more comfortable to not say it. Well, now you're living long term with the discomfort of you're yeah. not even allowing yourself to be yourself. Yeah. It's very uncomfortable. But then with more big tech censorship, that's a that that's a ever moving dragon. Yeah. One of the, the advantages that I as a comedian have when it comes to censorship is censorship tends to look for uh, content that is spoken literally. But as a comedian, I found his censorship grows. Unless you're Babylon B. <laughs> I know, <there's, laughs> I love that. As censorship grows, I've had to grow more creative to say what I need to say through metaphors or analogies. So basically say what I need to say without saying it right on the nose. Yeah. Because censorship, it I mean, it looks at things. It doesn't have heart and soul. It doesn't have a sense of humor. Yeah. It's just looking at literal words, typically. And then, of course, my my love language of humor is satire. Yeah. So if you looked at a transcript of a lot of my videos without tonality or looking at my face, you'd say, oh, this guy toes the line of the narrative because I'm speaking the language of satire. So right. I, I think that's one way that I've been able to, I wouldn't say beat censorship on a platform like YouTube, but it's more dance around censorship. Mm -hmm. um, who knows what they're doing with AI? Will they learn to recognize satire? <laughs> satire, but. Well, the problem is when the like stuff like Babylon B satire becomes real life, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, then what do you do, you know? It's, it's, <laughs> In the case in point, we've seen many examples, like you're saying, where Babylon Beale put out a hysterical satire piece. It's exaggerating something so absurdly, like math is racist. And now we're looking at headlines six months later, where we have these propaganda headlines, math is racist. Yeah. So what we find is right now, the, the, the tyranny, the the people that maybe don't have the best intentions, they're writing comedy itself. They're, they're, what they're doing is so exaggerated. They're pushing so hard, so fast that the comedy basically just writes itself. Yeah. To stick with on the comedy piece just for a little bit, um, obviously you could see how the tyrannical leaders don't want to be made fun of. Um, but when did the... People, since you've been in comedy, you're a comedian. Like, when did people stop being able to laugh at themselves? Because, like, I remember was that movie like growing up. It was like uh, trading places, like Dan Aykroyd and like uh, um, Eddie Murphy, yeah. and like they're just making fun of each other, right? Like different races, and it was fun, and everyone laughed. Or like growing up with the Jeffersons, or like um, it seemed like it was just like good fun, and we could just like all laugh and like. Yeah. Now people can't even laugh at themselves. Yeah. Do you, did, have, you, have you followed that or did you see anything that changed or just kind of like a gradual thing? Yeah, you know, uh, I, I have. And I think the, um, if there was a single ingredient about well, why, what makes someone not able to laugh at themselves? And now socially there's a lot of those people. Yeah. 
Uh, I would dare say it's unexpressed anger. Mm. What, when people have misdirected anger because they're not processing their emotions or they feel really out of control in life, so they're getting angry, see the world around them crumbling. But if they don't have a healthy outlet for their anger, which by the way, being on purpose, I think is one of the healthiest outlets yeah. for anger. It's like you do something constructive to make the world a better place. You look at what pisses you off about the world and then you do things to improve that. It's a great way to express anger. But when people don't do that, they cannot laugh at themselves. Why? Because they've got to project their anger outward onto someone else. And uh, because they're not owning their anger. If you're not going inward with your emotions, processing them, owning them, you can't go inward with your laughter because your laughter at yourself, that's an inward emotional exploration. Mm -hmm. So now you've just outlined two of the three conditions that have to be present for a mass yeah. formation psychosis. So one, having no sense of purpose and two, having this in untethered anxiety or fear. The first being the um, not being connected. Which tends to give rise to... They're downstream to each other, kind absolutely. of. Absolutely. So uh, Dr. McCullough, Dr. Malone had both recently talked about that on a Joe Rogan show. I did a video on it. Um, I had actually heard it years, uh, not years, months ago from uh, Dr. Desmond, who was on uh, Aubrey oh, Marcus. Yeah. That was the first time I heard him. Um, but yeah, so um, disconnected. I kind of, uh, I kind of think about that and like, if I was going to trace that back to a point in time, I look back to maybe like the 60s mm. because that was right when we went into the uh, age of like this free love kind of thing. And I think we really started to see the breakdown of the nuclear family mm. at that time. Um, the breakdown of the nuclear family, um, 1971, end of the Federal Reserve, which we'll jump into the money side here in a minute, end of the Federal Reserve. And at that point, um, massive social spending. So we saw this increase in unwed mothers this increase in um, you know, paying mothers to have babies without um, being married. So like really the breakdown of the social um, family unit. Um, and then when that starts to fall, and then also um, uh, an attack on morality, right? So all church was removed from everything. Yeah. And uh, whether you believe in religion or not, I mean, it's undeniable that it, it connects people. So you break down the connection, I think that's where it started. And then, uh, then it's downstream. So then you start losing connection and then you have no sense of purpose. And then once you have no connection, sense of purpose, then like you have this anxiety and you don't know what it belongs to. Yeah. I, and I'm curious with your perspective of tracking back to the sixties, when we start to lose our sense of connection, do you think that was by nefarious design, whether it's communist subversion or, or some other design, or do you think it was just, Things are changing and unintentionally we start to get disconnected. Well, I'm asking the questions here, but uh, <laughs> now, since you're putting me on the spot, um, I think uh, I, would, I would probably say both. I typically lean more towards um, not trying to label things as evil, more yeah. incompetence typically. Um, when I'm looking at financial things really and leader, you know, political things, um, typically I lean and I just try to believe my own bias that gets me in trouble a lot is I believe people are naturally good. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not always proven that way. Um, so I typically lean more towards incompetence. Um, but in that particular question, I think, I think for sure, and we know this is pretty much factual that, uh, you know, communism and socialism, Marxism did try to actually take hold and change our, our institutions. So I know that was done intentionally. Um, I think a lot of it was also done naturally as well. So I think probably what they did intentionally probably really helped yeah. to speed things up. But I, I would say mostly I think it was culture was already swinging that way would probably be my guess. Yeah. And, then, and then when you broke the money system and then, the, then you had this massive expansion of the federal government, that only helped further along. So there's probably three big things that were happening at the same time that weren't necessarily connected, but they all kind of pushed the same thing. Yeah. Maybe. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'm always wary of the, the communist subversion yeah. tactics that are going on. But then I, I think there's also an inadvertent or just changing. Um, but but it, to me, it seems as though I, I will I, I'll, well, I'll say this. I, to me, the most important thing, I, I think you you mentioned this. 
the nuclear family. Mm -hmm. I think that is the most important thing. And there seems to, certainly now, there seems to be a very, a very intentional assault mm -hmm. on destroying the nuclear family. I mean, yeah. you look at BLM, the founders have said like, we're, oh, yeah. we want to dis, dismantle the nuclear family. When I had Marxism, my, Marxism wants to break it down, yeah. Absolutely. And when I didn't grasp the importance of the nuclear family until I had my son, mm -hmm. and I saw how fragile this being is and how innocent and how influenced he is. And without the sacred garden of the family intact, he grew up with a huge hole. Mm -hmm. Not to say that hole is irreparable, but it takes intentional work for sure. a person to heal that. Yeah. And, and when you look at the four stages of mass psychosis, which here we are. Yeah. The, the first one being a lack of connection. Right. You... The, our primary connection has to be our nuclear family. I mean, and if we're connected there, that connection stays with us for the rest of our life. But then when you look at the second ingredient necessary for the mass formation, the lack of meaning, well, good luck finding a higher purpose meaning when you don't feel safe and secure because you have a lack of connection. It's exactly. kind of like the first we need to be connected. That's our self-preservation. Yep. We need a foundation there from which to launch our self-realization, which is finding a sense of meaning in life. And then, of course, when we, the first one's fractured, then, well, I can't find meaning. And, of course, the healthy reaction for feeling disconnected and meaning, meaningless, healthy reaction is anxiety. Yeah. It's healthy to feel anxiety because that's our biofeedback that there's something out of a line within the signal. It's the signal. Absolutely. Yeah. It's like check engine light on the car. <laughs> yeah. If we call that light anxiety, we want the car to show us that anxiety light right. to get our attention. There's something under the hood that needs attention. Yeah. So uh, then when we look at the, you know, the last piece of mass formation, fourth ingredient, uh, we need uh, a free floating, uh, uh, aggression and frustration, of course, natural to have that when we're anxious and we can't do anything with it. Yeah. So when we look at, wow, a healthy, intact nuclear family, kind of like it, it takes care of all that. And if we grew up without a nuclear family, that's not to say, hey, you're hopeless, but it's to say working on re recovering and healing. Yeah that might be a very important piece of our work, not only to improve our life, but also the world around us. Yeah. And not just the nuclear family, but even um, the country. So um, the media today is trying to tell us that we align based off of identity politics. So race, sex, preference, gender, et cetera. Um, but that's completely false. We align on values. Yeah. And so America used to have a set of values, American values, we'd call them, right? Um, the, you know, whatever pursuit of life, liberty and happiness and work hard and, you know, persevere and uh, all these things. And all of those values have been intentionally in now that I would be were intentionally destroyed. And so then you have this country that lacks any set of values that can bring together, which only pushes people more apart. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It, it tell people to connect via divisive aspects of their being. Yeah. I mean, it, what divides us the most, they're trying to sell us the story that that's what will connect us to the most. Yeah. Connect based on race, connect yeah. on and gender, connect on rage that you yeah. can channel yeah. with each other. If you, go to, if you go to any church, any denomination, uh, you know, any church, you're going to see every sex, race, uh, you know, whatever, not religion, obviously, but um, different people there. Uh, the Bitcoin conference coming up in a few months. We're both speaking there, by the way. Get your tickets. Uh and uh, there's going to be about 35,000 people. And there will be every race and sex and whatever gender there are, will be there, but sharing values. Yeah. So it's like we can look at all our differences, differences of race, religion, even differences of politics. But we can realize how we're all the same. Yeah. And that's by, by connecting to what matters more than any of the external things. And what matters is yeah. what you're saying, our values. Yeah. 
I want to get into the censorship piece because uh, that's a thing that you and I have done quite a, a few talks on lately. Um, before I jump into that, though, um, we were talking about politics. You weren't really into politics. You've been kind of paying attention to politics lately. Um, freedom in politics, I think you had said earlier, I wrote down. Um, is it political? Like, what is politics really? And does anybody even, should we even really care about politics? So like, uh, what do I mean by that? Like, um, again, being divided by left or right or elephant or ass, or um, I don't even know what these labels are anymore, socialism or capitalism or communism or fascism, I don't even know. Um, it seems like it's two heads feeding the same stomach in a sense, and it's just more to divide us. And uh, people like, we don't wanna talk about these things because I don't wanna get into politics. Um, but is it politics? I'm curious. I, I look at it like um, freedom, cho choice, individual. I want to be an individual. I don't want to be in a political party. Yeah. Um, is it political for me to say that I want freedom and I want choice? Yeah. For me, no. It's human nature right. to say <laughs> I want freedom and choice. But I think when there's... Uh, sociopathic people in the world who probably weren't held enough as children. <laughs> they didn't have a nuclear family. <laughs> yeah. And, and so they, they get off on trying to control other people. They're uh, control other people by somehow getting them to lose their freedoms. That is a sociopathic person trying to get someone to disconnect from their own human nature and that's not political. I, I think they'll try to sell the narrative it's political so that quite honestly, they're not seen for doing what I would call is evil. Mm -hmm. And I know evil can sound like an abstract term of hyperbole, but let me give you my definition of evil. For me, evil is anyone who tries to control another person in a way that's not in their best interest. Mm -hmm. That's what I that's mean by that's evil. Easy. Yeah. So I think freedom is our human Coercion. nature. Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, I, I think uh, I, I think evildoers want us to pretend and buy into a BS story that freedom is political. But no, freedom is innate human nature. It's it's not up for discussion. Yeah. So I think participating in the discussion at a certain level strengthens the frame. So, yeah, in a way, I think we, we have a lot of problems in the world that are in the political arena, but the political arena, maybe we could just say it's corrupt enough that a lot of those problems won't be solved at the political level because it's kind of a, a pretty swampy yeah. playing field. I think they need to be solved outside the political arena at more of a human level. And that's super abstract, but... It, well, it is abstract, but I think it's helpful because I think these are human issues, human rights issues. And when I say rights, um, the right, what, what rights? Um, a, I can't have a human right on your labor. So I can't have a right to health care. Now I have a right to you treat working on me. Right? I can't have a right to education. Now you have to teach. I can't have a right on your, your right. labor. The only thing I can have a right on is back to what I call freedom, which I can have a right to choose. Yeah. Right. And so I think these are human issues. And I think back to the mass formation psychosis real quickly, um, Dr. Malone kind of put this into like, uh, we're talking to Dr. Mateus and he, he said, how do we get out of this? And he said, well, there's four ways, four things to get into it, four things to get out of it. And so one is that we speak the truth in love, mm. speak the truth. Um, two, he said, um, we don't want to fight because that would just only like channel their anger on us. Um, three, we need to bring people connect. We need to connect people because of course they were disconnected. So we have to show them a way to get connected, which is why they've connected to go into this one that they're in right now. But the fourth one is the, is the interesting one and something that I've been guilty of myself, which is like, hold the line. Yeah. Don't, don't go there. Right? Like we don't want that. Like hold the line. But he says that won't work because they were unhappy with where they were. 
So that's why they're willing to go to this new normal. Mm. So we have we can't say hold the line, stay where you were. They don't want to stay there. Yeah. We have to offer them somewhere else to go. And I think that's why um, nobody wants to get into politics and fight and get dirty. But like we can like rise above this. We're like this is like human. This is just human stuff. It's not politics. Yeah. It's not left or right or us or them. It's about like us as humans being allowed to choose versus the tyranny of them trying to take that away. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Um, back to censorship. Now, um, obviously, you've, you want to say what you want to say. You're a comedian. You want to poke fun at it. I get all that. What are the dangers of censorship, do you think, from a societal level? Because I think it goes a lot deeper than just you as a comedian not being able to say what you want to say. A hundred percent. And in the scheme of things, me being able to say what I have to say, like, it doesn't matter. I mean, it matters to me, but like one voice out of eight billion. Right. The bigger concern is uh, at a massive level and uh, so many concerns. But uh, for me, one of the one of the concerns I notice the most is how censorship from big tech naturally teaches us to self-censor. Because you and I have talked before about- Yeah, it's bad. We, now we're probably making a conscious choice, but we notice ourselves when we're making a YouTube video, we're self-censoring so we don't get deplatformed. And you know, I've, I've noticed uh, at the end of comedy shows, I do a, a VIP meet and greet for after my stand-up shows, a VIP stay behind. We have an open discussion, a Q and A. It's a beautiful experience. And there's times where, uh, like, I'm someone might ask a question about one of the topics can't really talk about on yeah. YouTube, and, and and like I'm a I, I, I have the stream of thought I want to say, but like I'll constrict it, and it'll take me two seconds to realize like, oh. I can say this. Yeah. I can talk about anything I want here. Yeah. We're in person. So it quite honestly frightens me that there's a level of second nature of self-censorship. And, and then at a, a bigger level, we can look at history. Mm -hmm. Censorship has never been on the right side of history. Yeah. And as you pointed out, uh, censorship is always proportional to the level of bad kind of you know abusive ideas that are there that would be quickly demolished in an open forum yeah. by truth yeah. so you know we can't always see the bad ideas it might be like carbon monoxide but when we hear the ding of censorship that lets us know there's poisonous gas in yeah. the air whether we see it or not yeah and you know i think some of the best aspects of our beautiful human nature is our ability to express the unseen so express our thoughts express ideas and words are the primary paintbrush yeah. that uh, humans are gifted with to express beauty yeah. and to express things that make life a gift rather than a curse and when we have censorship we're we're literally killing life. Mm -hmm. We're killing the unseen that's a part of life. Maybe a pulse doesn't end because we have censorship, but we're killing life expression. Well, you said earlier that freedom was like freedom to expand my life. And so without hearing new ideas or being able to discuss those new ideas, then how can my life expand, right? Yeah. So you're killing life, I guess, to your point. Um, one thing that I think of that brings me a lot of hope, uh, there, well, there's a saying that I have said before, I, I, I didn't say it, I, I repeat it, but um, ripping a man's tongue out does not prove him wrong. Yeah. It only proves he had something to, you know, something that you want to hide, right? You have something Amen. to hide. Um, and so I think it's evident to people, to a lot of people anyway, are waking up on this. One thing that brings me hope is um, the world changes when we have these um, mega political things that happen in the world. And um, technology is usually at the forefront of that. And so um, 500 years ago was the Protestant Reformation and the church had complete monopoly over society. And uh, the church was really good 500 years earlier and had done all these social projects, but 500 years later, they were like peak corruption. And um, 
About uh, 70 years before the Protestant Reformation, a new technology had been in invented called the printing press. Mm -hmm. And once it started printing out Bibles and putting them in people's hands and they got the information, they're like, wait a minute, this isn't what you've been telling me all along. This is different. And anybody that would speak out to that would be put to death, heretics, mm -hmm. right? heresy. That was punishable by death. And for a long time, for decades, uh, probably millions of people probably died over speaking out, but it couldn't be stopped. Yeah. And eventually, it, it, it broke out. Um, the, the free flow of ideas led to the greatest explosion the world had ever seen in science and technology and led to the industrial revolution. And I think we're there again today. So we have technology. Um, the internet has allowed us to get this free flow of information. And um, no matter how much they try today, they assassinate people the same. They assassinate them online. Yeah. Um, maybe Hillary does a little bit more than that. <laughs> <laughs> you said it. Hey, hey. Hillary, 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 Hillary Mark said it, not <laughs> Hopefully me. my channel doesn't dis disappear off that. Uh, see, we're censoring each other now. Um, but, um, you know, we have this technology that, and, and we're starting to see uh, to the video you said, I think is probably live at the time of this recording. And I just recorded about uh, uh, Nancy Pelosi beating all the Wall Street traders. And uh, we can see that information. We can share that information. They can't hide that information. Um, so I'm very hopeful of what happens. It's tough to live through right now, yeah. but it's just a repeat of history. But again, it's the technology that shifts that. So um, if we want to transition a little bit more, um, the internet has done really well for that, but at the same time, a lot of it has become centralized. Yeah. Right? And, um, but, and so we need to get to a point where technology can free that. And so I know that you and I are working on a project together, not to turn this into a commercial, but I mean, to give some hope to people. Um, you're wearing a shirt. Why don't you tell us about what we're doing with that? Yeah, you know, I, I will, and, and I'll lead in th into that by also sharing with you, you shared a bit about what gives you hope. Here's what gives me hope. When we look at censorship, and it's a massive problem. It's a, it's a life killer, quite honestly. And it's a symptom of evil, mm -hmm. in my opinion. When we look at censorship, it is 100% our fault. We, we have put our eggs into the baskets of these centralized systems and companies that censor us. So it's all been consensual censorship. And I don't think we need to play the victim mentality of, oh, big tech, they're the evil ones and poor us, they're censoring us. Mm, good point. We need to raise our hand and say, it's all our fault. Here's the good news about that. When we realize it's our fault, mm. we can choose to not make it our fault anymore, which means instead of solely subscribing to these centralized systems that will censor and they'll only censor more, we can do a little Gandhi, be the change we wish to see in the world and start creating better alternatives. Um, when we realize it's our fault, we realize we have the power to choose something different. Right. And that's freedom, right. as you mentioned. And we might say, well, there's nothing different. Well, that's why we innovate something different first. And one of the things that you know, I'm so proud to be a part of with you that's a real innovative technology is Zion, a social network that runs, it's not only decentralized, it runs on Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. In Bitcoin, I mean, I used to just think of like Bitcoin's like an asset what like it's it's online money like how what else can that do right but learning actually the technology that is bitcoin it's the infrastructure it's a digital infrastructure a network of freedom and sovereignty it's a yeah. network and uh, zion has figured out a way to not only allow that network to be a communication of money but to be a communication of thoughts ideas a social platform and so Zion exists to give the power back to the people so we can have social networks, creator communities, chat one-on-one -on -one with friends, pay for things online, all in a decentralized way. Mm -hmm. And that's what makes Zion so that it's not one of these steps away from the problem where we've got you know the rumbles, the parlors, the getters, which I'm a fan of, I yeah. want them to succeed, I'm on them all. But the, they're a step away from the problem because they're pledging not to censor, but they're still centralized companies right. and that's that the problem. could censor. But what Zion is doing, we're, we're seeking to solve the problem by creating a decentralized environment where creators and individuals 
they're decentralized. They have their own node, their own server, which means nobody is governing them. They're on Zion, able to function as a free sovereign individual. So it, it just so happens minds that are certainly way brighter than mine involved in yeah. Zion have recognized that Bitcoin technology is the digital infrastructure that allows this to happen. So, you know, it's our fault. We, if, if we continue to subscribe to systems that are controlled and censored and centralized, it's our fault. If we continue to build new innovative systems like Zion that give freedom to people, not control, that are decentralized rather than centralized, that are uh, censorship resistant, impossible to censor rather than censorship rich. Yeah. Well, that's our fault too. Yeah. And, yeah. and I know what I want to choose to be my fault. Yeah. Yeah. It was like I was telling you before about this talk I gave with Ron Paul over the weekend. And I said, um, we don't, uh, Socrates said, focus all your energy not on fighting the old, but building the new. Yeah. So instead of trying to change section 230 to penalize these people for censoring information, um, instead of fighting, we can just go build. Yeah. You know? And we, we actually got the challenge because um, when the active sitting president of the United States got, got kicked off, um, and then uh, everybody started going to Parler, and then Parler got kicked out of the app stores, and they said, well, build your own app stores. And then um, they got, kicked off of Amazon and it's like, well, build your own internet, right? And it's like, challenge accepted. Yeah. We'll go build our own internet. Yeah. And uh, that's kind of what happened. It, I, I think that's, that's exactly it. And we were talking about uh, mass formation psychosis and, you know, like a lot of big tech structures facilitate that. I mean, it's really a psychosis that, yeah. that, that they're facilitating. And when I was hearing Dr. Malone talk a bit about uh, mass formation and how to, uh, or it may, maybe it was Matthias Desmet, how to, one of the solutions out of it is build parallel structures. So not fighting the structures that you're against, mm -hmm. but as you mentioned, building parallel structures where, no, 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 we're, we're not fighting against what we don't want, we're building what we do want. Yeah. And in other words, we're focusing our energy where we want it to go, not where we don't want it yeah. to go, what we're against. So we have the old paradigm of big tech and there's been so much beauty and innovation and joy along the way. And, and honestly, I think with big tech, for every bad thing, there's 10 good things. Oh, yeah. But with... with, with for, for, as a, for as oppressive and censoring as it is, there's still massive amounts of information that gets out there. 100%. Yeah. And, and I look at the, ba the old paradigm of big tech, centralized, they own all our data, we give all our power away to them. That's a pair of pants that we as the toddlers, it's like the internet age, like we didn't have the internet when we were kids. Yeah. So the, the internet, it's new. So we've grown through the, the toddler phase of it. And, and the old paradigm of big tech, that was like a pair of pants that fit us really well until we turned three. Yeah. You know, they fit us great at two, but then we turned three, <laughs> we kept them on, then yeah. we turned four, like, well, these are really tight. And we're five, now we're 10 years old with this pair of pants <laughs> designed to fit yeah. us when we were two. And we've all outgrown these pants. So I think we're, we're those of us that, you know, care to be the change we wish to see in the world, people who are freedom minded, now we're in the process of taking off the old pants uh, and, and creating the new pants that we want that fit us really good for where we're at right yeah. now. Yeah, yeah, I love it's that. It's a new paradigm, I think. And the, and the key piece that I want to just, just hit on it, uh, just to make it clear, is that, um, as you mentioned, there are all these other platforms that have popped up in the parlors and the rumbles and now the getters, et cetera. Um, the thing that I've been afraid of as a content creator is like to go move everything I have over to those platforms and then they just go down the same path and yeah. they, they meant to be open, like Twitter was meant to be open, but then eventually they're not. Yeah. And I guess the key difference of what Zion is doing built on Bitcoin is that um, it's a little bit more work because I have to run my own node, which go to get Zion and figure that out. But I have to run my own node. It's a little bit more work, but it allows me to 
own my own data. Of course, with social networks and internet, they say if you don't pay for the product, you are the product. Yeah. And so here, I'm not. I I am paying for the product, but I'm not the product. I own it. And as a as a content creator, my community is owned by me. No one could shut it off. And then um, because of that, the key difference is that it's not that um, Twitter promised to never censor you, but now they do. And Rumble promised to never censor you, but maybe they will. Zion can't. Yeah. There's nothing they can do that ever could. And I think that's the key difference. Yeah, that, amen. That is yeah. the key difference that matters to me as a creator. Because we, you know, just the, I'm not a tech-minded person, so here's my um, layman's term explanation for how we're different. You mentioned when, when you're on Zion, you run your own node and a node uh, that's basically just a mini server, right, which mini server. Zion can host for you in the cloud. You don't have to know anything about tech. You can just sign up for it and it's running. It's great. So that means, you know, if you and I are on Zion, Mark, instead of Zion being, you know, this, you know, centralized like Facebook at the top of the triangle. Mm -hmm. I'm a corner on the triangle. You're a corner on the triangle. Anytime you and I want to communicate on this centralized Facebook, if you will, our communication has to go up to the mothership right. point, the uh, top point of the triangle. And then if it passes through them, it gets to you. But with Zion, no, we're connecting directly to each other, your node to my node. The communication isn't on a massive centralized server. Yeah. Peer to peer. Peer to peer. So I look at my my private community on Zion. You know, right now we've got over a thousand people in it. So when I send out a post, it goes from my node directly to their nodes. There is literally no one in between that to censor. Now, we, we, if you look at the founder of Zion, Justin Rosvani, if he got assassinated tomorrow. Let's just say, like, Hillary Clinton gets the gun out. She's like, what's this? <laughs> he got on the wrong side of Hillary. <laughs> right. And then some new nefarious CEO takes over Zion and says, I got to put an end to this digital freedom. Let me put in new rules and community guidelines. Let's yeah. get those. So they have all these guidelines. You can't say this, this. Then they go to censor you. They realize it is, it's technically impossible for the head of Zion to censor people on Zion because they're able to function free and independently, my node to your node. So the beauty is it's not a pledge to stay censorship free. It's built on Bitcoin technology, which means that technology does not allow censorship. In other words, it's the technology imprint of freedom. Yeah, I love it. Um, You've built up a good community, a thousand people. I'm about to launch my community on there. I know Just, Justin's been on me to get to get that going. Uh, not to turn this video into a commercial, but uh, as I said just this couple of days ago, I was speaking at Ron Paul with Ron Paul, and I said, "Don't fight against it. Build the world you want. Um, I'm not going to fight against the education system. My kids just aren't going to go there anymore. Right. Uh, I'm not going to fight against the medical system. I'm just going to go pay to see my own doctors." Uh, I don't want to fight against big tech. I'm just going to go work on my own tech platform. And I don't want to fight against the Fed. I'm going to go use my own money. Yeah. And so not to turn this into a, into a commercial, it's that I want to build the world that I want. Uh, I know there's a massive waiting list to get on there. I think they're opening up like 500 new spots. So at the time of this recording, you might be able to go get a spot. Um, but I think that's, uh, we've covered a lot. Anything else that we have uh, left to say? <laughs> yeah, you know, because it's a passion project, I would just say, you know, if, if uh, someone's out there interested in learning more about Zion or you just want to jump on, you can go right to getzion.com. And, you know, just being by being on Zion, you're literally helping build the digital infrastructure of freedom and sovereignty. So uh, because the way the technology works, you being on it actually strengthens the network. Yeah. So we can know just by being on it, aside from all the benefits we get, we're altruistically helping to build the digital world that we want. And if we do that at GetZion.com. And, you know, Gandhi said, be the change you wish to see in the world. He didn't say fight against the change you don't want. Right. Be the change you I don't want. And I think right now we're living in a time and space where the world needs warriors. Warriors who are willing to embody with their thoughts, words, and actions the world they want to see. Because that's how meaningful change happens. So I love how you talk 
always talk about build what you want. Yep. And I think we can do that in all aspects of our life. And when we do that, I think we have great hope for a bright future. Nice. Uh, your Twitter, Awaken with JP, I believe. Yeah. Twitter, Awaken yeah. with JP. Um, YouTube, just JP. But, actually, Awaken with JP um, with across both. Both. Oh, everything. Across everything. So check that out. Uh, <laughs> some of the, everyone needs a good laugh these days. The world is sad. It's scary. It's dark. Get a good laugh. Um, and that's it. I guess we'll wrap it up. Thanks so much. Thanks for having me, Mark. All right.